Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. All right. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us again. Um, it's wonderful to see you. It's another Friday, and it's a great beginning to the new year, and another beginning for an exciting Covering Environment seminars. Um, and I just want to thank everyone, all the faculty, staff, and students joining us here, as well as you here in the classroom, our CA enthusiasts, volunteers, and everyone part of this uh, uh, program. And thank you all for your contributions. And also thanks to those joining us from the web. I believe we have about 13, um, 14, participants joining us today so thank you so much i wanted to say that this is an exciting year also for for uh the controlled environment agriculture center as we are celebrating our 20th anniversary of the establishment of this center so we are very excited and and we will have special events and programs presentations throughout the year and i wanted to mention actually two of them to you now that we have our 19 uh, 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 short course coming up in the first week of March, and you're seeing that on the screen here, March 2nd through 6th. So if you're interested, if you know anybody in your network uh, who might be interested, please encourage them to join us and I encourage you to join us as well. And then we are going to give one week break after the short course, and then we will uh, we are hosting an international meeting for controlled environment technology and use March 15th through 18th. And um, we will have a great program there, speakers invited and keynote speakers from all over the world. So please, again, if you're interested, join us and please encourage those in your network to join us as well. More to come, please stay tuned, visit our website and we're very excited to have our special speakers today, Jim and Jen uh, Wagner. Thank you for joining us today. And I'm gonna uh, pass the microphone to our uh, seminar coordinator, Rafi Grinner, for the introduction. Thank you, Rafi. Thank you, Murat. Thank you. Every once in a while, when I uh, deal with speakers and prospective speakers, I come across some very unusual people and some people whose creativity is just simply superb, simply amazing. I had the chance to preview some of the slides that you're going to see today that were, uh, that show the, the uh, product of uh, Gene and Jim's Wagner um, building of what they call their piece of paradise. And just looking at it from here, uh, it qualifies. And as a matter of fact, I think you're going to have a lot of people knocking on your door if you disclose exactly where it is. So I wouldn't. Gene <laughs> um, and uh, Jim Wagner uh, come to us originally from the Midwest. So they are the sort of people that we call here, uh, what are they called? Snowbirds, <laughs> but uh, they have brought to Tucson a completely innovative, unique, unusual project of building their house, building the estate that they live on, building a greenhouse, building a pool inside the greenhouse, and so on and so forth. You are going to hear a lot about all of the details and the creativity that went into doing that. I was told, and I immediately connected with that aspect of you growing up, that when you were growing up, you had two erector sets. <laughs> and <laughs> your wife is, uh, is uh, gave me all this information. Um, and that's something that I had when I was growing up. Uh, erector set. I don't know where yours was made. Mine was made in the UK and it was all metal. And I enjoyed working with my dad actually building different things. 
So this is where the seed of the creativity, I think, can be linked to, at least I'd like to think so. And then they went through the usual things of work and jobs and moving, and eventually they came to Tucson to tell us about a piece of paradise in Tubac. So welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess I'm going to try this. How does that work? Maybe I should use that, huh? You can hear? OK. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you, all of you at SEAC. You're wonderful people. And thank you, all of you, for attending. We uh, consider it an honor, and we're really pleased to be here. Now, I've got to. Um, A little louder. OK. You know, I'm going to try this. I think I might be. Is that okay? Here. Oh, there. All right, we try this. Good. Can, do the lights dim? Can we see that? Great. We're starting with our uh, morning sunrise off of our porch, looking at the Santa Rita Mountains. And this is the most concise uh, execution we could pre uh, pre provide Rafi. I'm going to read it uh, word by word. Together, you can follow. We have used the principles of sustainable living to develop our retirement homestead to, pro to provide us with a healthy, eco-friendly, self-sufficient, and enjoyable lifestyle while controlling our cost of living and reducing our carbon footprint. Now, I have to see how this works. Oops. Oh. Now I understand why they have problems on when I watch these online. I point this. Okay, let me try. I have problems with all those words. <laughs> so I'm going to paraphrase that and simplify it, and everything I say is going to be revolved around these two words, sustainable and attainable. Now, I foot, my first footnote to attainable, everything you're going to see, all the construction, all the ideas, all the work, is 98% done by Gene and I. That's the way we've lived our 45 years together, and that's what makes things work for us because we don't have to listen to anybody else. <laughs> I'm sure you've all, I bet all of you have been to Tubac, but this is our neighborhood in Tubac and there are no gift shops or outdoor restaurants. <laughs> this shot is taken four miles from our house, so it's the beginning of the tour. Oops. When you uh, get two miles closer, you hit Josefina Canyon, and you have to drive through the wash. Right at that, right before you hit the wash, you make a severe uh, turn, and if you're not paying attention, you'll end up in the wash. So there's about a three-second window to see our house, and uh, most, if you're driving, you don't see it at all. But the 27 foot by 100 foot greenhouse is out the back. Oops. Oh, let's see. There's a lot of buttons here. There we go. It's out the back right there. We worked very hard to make sure it didn't sit on top of our hill and look like a glittering Eiffel Tower. So uh, when you go another half mile, you go through the wash and back up. And this is the view from the south. 
uh, Rafi asked me to uh, add some time frames and costs. Five and a half years ago, we stood in this spot and it was the very first time we saw the piece of real estate. And we looked at each other and said, this is probably going to be the most expensive campsite we've ever had. <laughs> we love the great outdoors. This is the top of our driveway, or the head of the driveway. And you might think my camera is out of focus, but the house does not sit on top of the hill. It's a horseshoe shape, and it's cut into the perimeter of the hill. So what you see on the top, this is the backyard. The backyard is higher than the house, and of course the trees are higher. So looking south, you do not see the uh, house at all. And looking west, you can see how we buried the east side of the greenhouse four feet down in the ground. I refer to that, as you maybe read, um, three screens back, as respectful architecture for the landscape. This is a bird's eye view. Uh, we have a huge wash, which we get six feet of water in and can't get out the main entrance. And then the wash that runs through our drive, we get about four feet of water. Uh, they are both on federal floodplains and we're not allowed to build within 100 feet of that. The house sits up on a hill at 4,200 square feet. Up at the house site, we have the greenhouse, rainwater harvesting, solar field, which you can see uh, to the right there. We have a citrus orchard, outdoor vegetable gardens, and our fruit tree orchard. Halfway up the drive, uh, we have a receiving area, which we need uh, to receive a lot of materials. But more importantly, at this point, we have different piles of compost aging at different stages for the gardens. The zone is way down at the bottom. And believe it or not, that's about 10 or 15 degrees cooler than up at the house, especially in these winter months. You may not need a jacket up at the house, but when you go down there, you do. So that's uh, where our well pump is. It's also where our fruit orchard is for those trees requiring cold chill, a lot of cold chill hours. And that's where we begin our composting process. If we zoom in as close to the house as we can, you'll see some disks. There are 10 disks. Uh, those three were not there yet uh, when Google took this image. Those are the tops of our rain harvesting tanks. All of the tanks are six foot in diameter. They're road culverts. Uh, there are 10 tanks, and we have a total capacity of 21,000 gallons of rainwater. Now, also down at the bottom where I first showed you a mile and a half from the house, that's the closest any trucks can get to delivering materials. So <laughs> everything you see has to be shagged from a mile and a half away. We uh, wanted to get a bid. We got two bids. We didn't want to do this ourselves. And this is what we found with everything. The 10 tanks, uh, at the time, they would only, well, we had two companies in other Tucson. They only bid seven of them. They would only do them eight foot tall, not as tall as we did, 10, 12, and 14. And they always exclude excavation. But when you live on top of a mountain, that's a big of the cake. So given those, they wanted $22,000 and $40,000 to do the job. We did all those 10 tanks for $12,000 ourselves, including renting this uh, four-wheel ATV in order to uh, move these huge tanks. Uh, Gene transferred them up in the trailer. I transferred the big ones up in the uh, forklift. We were able to place them all around the property. And for each one, we 
formed up a two by 12 uh, concrete pad, five ace rebar, and then installed all the pipes. We picked them up with cables on the end and then lowered them into the wet concrete. This is the four foot tank. We started with a small one for practice. Uh, the 14 ones were a little more harrowing. This one had to be lifted up and placed between the garage and the um, breezeway. You'll notice the bottom is painted one foot up. Gene painted all the bottoms in order to seal um, that cut raw edge, which would not be galvanized, and then seal also the galvanized tank itself so that they would last a long time, longer than the 25 years they're warranted. And uh, pro polypropylene tanks, which are very flat, are only warranted for five to 10 years, depending on which ones you buy. Uh, the next day, the forms are removed. They're, you reconfigure them for the next tank, get that plumbed up. And then after they're all in, we welded up our tops. Our tops are um, perforated metal. They're closed for safety. And then we're able to remove them and uh, get in there and clean them out. It's a big advantage over a polypropylene tank with a little manhole. It keeps debris out, critters out, and most importantly, keeps the mold and fungus and you avoid that dark, wet space because it stays dry. But now, the disadvantage of that, you might say, well, it's going to evaporate. Before the tops go on, we float one inch polyurethane panels. They rise up and down with the water, eliminating evaporation. And with a little quarter cup or so of uh, Crisco oil, vegetable oil, that floats around the um, one inch perimeter, keeps the mosquitoes away. Uh, this is uh, prep for the, two, the three tanks of the greenhouse. This is when they were all put in. And when they're all done, we let that concrete in the bottom cure, crack, and pull away from the insides. And then we pour in a half inch of self-loving leveling concrete. That seals things up. We wait 30 days and spray them with a portable uh, tank sealer. This is how they look uh, when they're put in. Uh, we built walls around them, did rock uh, faces. Uh, the two tanks on the east side uh, were covered five feet up. Every set of uh, tanks has a jet pump and a pressurized tank that services that section of the yard with all the hose bibs and automatic irrigation. The three tanks on the west side, 14, 12, and 10 feet, uh, you can see how the scupper dumps right in there. We don't ever have to clean gutters or little downspouts. All the, they're so big, the debris flies out, bounces off, or when it dries, the wind blows it off. So it's a self-cleaning system. No, we don't have any maintenance as far as that goes. These are the three tanks at the greenhouse that catch that roof. And um, this is after the retaining wall was built. Now, how do we... Uh, how do we handle getting all that water in there? Ruffians in, okay with time. <laughs> the uh, gutter we designed ourselves is a nine and a half inches deep because you know what kind of rains we get. It's like all or none. And the dust dumps down and we'll get three or four inches of rain at a time. So they're very deep, nine and a half inches for that reason. Secondly, the ramadas that go around the house are made with uh, four by six timbers. And if you've, you know how uh, vegas and timbers uh, decay and rot from the sun and the rain, this covers those timbers. And uh, third, we love the design because it gives you these long linear lines. And the backyard we, you saw from the top, these are the back patios from the bottom. And you'll notice the Vegas way out on each uh, 
leg east and west, it actually anchored up into the earth. Gives the house a real nice campsite feel. And yes, uh, we did gutters on the greenhouse also. Everyone kind of rolled their eyes, but you don't put the gutter at the eave. You put it down at the knee wall and we cut and make them really wide and deep and we catch a good 90% of the rain. I think I'm gonna, um, I missed one important point. Uh, I'll just have to go catch it. The rain, uh, the rain tanks, the gutters, they collect rain at the rate of 7,000 gallons per inch. So we can fill up those 21,000 gallons of tanks in a lot of big monsoon rains in an hour. Okay, second source of water, gray water. Of course, we have a two inch line that connects all the showers, sinks, laundry, all the kitchen. That goes into a 60 gallon holding tank and uh, twice every two days or three days, Gina will open this ball valve that's in the ground and it flows through that six inch uh, perforated pipe 140 feet down the uh, west garden and it feeds those, or those uh, orchard trees and that garden easily. You can dig down any time of year and it's teeming with uh, worms. Third source of water. Down in the zone, uh, we have a pump house. And then next to the pump house, we have an underground polypropylene tank that holds 1,200 gallons of water. That's for our domestic house use. I'm gonna tell you now, we're gonna start construction of the greenhouse. And when you live on top of a mountain, we found things are um, complicated to no end. Uh, we got our first three quotes to, for excavation. They were 80,000, 110,000, dollars That excludes, and they put this in the contract, that excludes any hammer time, and it excludes all the truckloads that they're going to haul out of all the of all the material. And then on top of that, they don't go into this. But then whatever else you need, the backfilling, and uh, your roads and your landscaping, they're going to haul in all new rock every time. So we were pretty devastated. We thought our project had ended before it uh, got off the start, uh, starting block. And our friend Lucky was around that day and he said, next week, there's a, a, a Richie Brothers heavy duty equipment auction up in Phoenix. Next week, we had our own backhoe. The backhoe was $25,000. And uh, we did our, our, even our neighbors said 130,000, you can double it with all those add-ons. So we did our $200,000 whatever excavation job for um, $1,000 of diesel fuel and $500 of hydraulic hoses. I also had to learn how to be a hydraulics mechanic. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's how we made it work. Of course, uh, that included this 850 pound hydraulic hammer. Now, I can't play the piano and I was really, really worried about whether I was gonna learn the joysticks. And for about three days, Gene stayed way away. <laughs> so, up at the pad for the greenhouse. I didn't believe the, the one es estimate we got. He said, you're gonna have, you don't understand, you're gonna have to move 800 cubic yards of rock. And I went, right. So I had a nice little spiral bound book. Every uh, load I checked, I had finished 800 cubic yards of rock. The first 400 cubic rock yards went down 
to make a pad for the solar field. The next 400 uh, we wanted to use for um, landscaping, doing the drive, uh, building the rock walls. Well, when you look at that, how are you going to do it? Jean says, I have an idea. She, uh, she went and found this old uh, green cattle guard. We tore off three uh, uh, privacy iron gates over the windows. And then up here at uh, Tractor Supply, we bought a four by four um, grid they use for animal fences. And uh, we welded that all up. And uh, it's not a welding job I was proud of, but it worked. We stood that up, moved it along, and uh, shook 400 cubic buckets of uh, 400 buckets of, uh, of dirt. And you can see here as the finds we used for backfill and the top dress our driveways. The uh, three, the four inch to uh, 16 inch we used as riprap to build up our driveways. And the big boulders we used to make garden bed walls. Um, that's how we attained that. And we feel in the process by being respectful of the land and reusing what we were digging out instead of throwing it out, that we were able to um, attain what we needed to do. Now this is what it looks like when we were finally done after three months of hammering. Uh, the wall, it's hard to believe, but it was 14, in, 14 feet deep. Um, down in the bottom here, uh, this is the bottom of the pool. You can see the footings going along the east wall. Uh, and this is the footings for the south wall. What was very hard for us, and we got a lot of bad um, assistance from engineers, architects, etc. The... Uh, pool wall and the east wall of the structure were one and the same. Uh, nobody wanted to do anything with that. They, they were afraid of it. But we did it with uh, ICF blocks. We, you said they're all nine inches thick, so we have an insulated pool on all the walls. And the, every three rows, there's a solid concrete um, bond beam with rebar. In the bottom of the pool then, we put down seven inches of expanded polystyrene as a base. On top of it goes this creotherm um, panel. I brought one along. And then you lock into that the half inch PEX tubing, which integrated with the house for our hydronic uh, radiant floor system. Uh, the other, um, these are floor drains, north and south. The only thing we've contracted for in five years is the concrete work and the installation of the solar field. Uh, after that pool was done, we had to run all the mechanicals, all the utilities underground, Then we were able to start pouring the footings on all the other walls. While the footings were wet, you push and stamp in the styrofoam wall panels. And you can see the bond beam I was talking about here where it gets poured. And you can see here, I have a laser level. All of these walls had to be within an eighth inch or the greenhouse would go together quickly and you would have a disaster. So as we put up the walls, we kept working our way back. The, and uh, we laid on all the mechanicals, the floor drains, the lighting, and the most important of all, now think about this, 
every wire for all of the 20 or 30 electrical connections for the greenhouse roof had to be laid in the ground, come up through the concrete wall, right at the right spot to hit inside of those um, aluminum posts. And there's some of the, that's the wiring where they all went into the relays for the, um, for the workings. And these are, the, again, the creotherm panels. That's uh, three inches of uh, AB, wet and tamped, and then the creotherm panels. And then all the hydronic tubing. Six zones for the greenhouse and the two zones for the pool. This might be a good spot for me to um, just uh, deviate a little bit or give you a footnote. They all go into the mechanicals room in the house and connect to that hydronic system. But what we have found, I put in a set of bi bypass valves and we have been running now for a couple months. The water during the day, we, the water runs through the pipes in the greenhouse and then it circulates back and runs through the pipes under the pool. So during the day when that floor gets to be about 120 degrees, moving that heat into the pool, helps to cool the greenhouse during the day. Then at night, it's still running. It's pulling the heat from the pool back to the greenhouse, all to stabilize the, the environment. And that's what she looks like from there. The walls are, are stuccoed, the aluminum caps going on, and we're ready to build the greenhouse. The greenhouse, um, the aluminum our verticals are two by four eighth inch steel or aluminum, thick aluminum. And the, hoard, the rafters are two by six uh, eighth inch thick tubular aluminum. We bought this from Florian Greenhouse. They are by far the best um, product you can buy. They have an on-site um, calculator. They have an online calculator. You go in there, punch in your sizes and your options, and they'll give you a price. So, uh, one, the the, uh, the aluminum starts going up starts heading north. We had a nice uh, double rainbow for a day, which helped us a little bit. And then um, three, you get to the end and you get the glass in and it's done. 650 panels of dual pane glass. It took us three weeks. We only had help on Saturdays to erect all the aluminum. Then it took us two months, Jean and I, to install every piece of glass along with 10,000 lineal feet of rubber gas. So, welcome to the inside. Am I doing all right with this mic? Okay. At the south end, we have a 100 amp panel. We have a post-harvest work center for cleaning our produce. Uh, along with a few hospitality amen amenities, uh, like the margarita blender. And uh, next to that, again, are these uh, manifolds all built in. And then next to that is the LED pool lighting. In the center of the east side is the lap pool. Eight feet wide, 52 feet long, four feet deep. If you look outside of the window, you'll see that rock wall still. It's uh, turned out really nice. And there's, that's 12,000 gallons of water. And as I said, provides great thermal mass. The four foot depth is great. You can stop anytime you get tired, plenty deep enough to swim. And uh, it's uh, in about 30 years, I think we'll be able to toss our walkers over there and then do some aerobics with our walkers. And the four foot height, when you're in the pool, you can turn around, put your elbows on that uh, bench top. Perfect bar top height to order up a margarita. 
Uh, yes, we were swimming. We were swimming once or twice every single day. Uh, but you will see we have not had time uh, to get the uh, pool heating uh, tubes up on the roof because uh, the roof wasn't there. So uh, we're just about ready to fire that back up. So the last six weeks, it's been too cold. But we think uh, we'll easily be able to swim all year round and uh, have the perfect environment. Yes, sir. I'm going to tell you that just shortly here. At the north end of the pool is a shower. Uh, this is our pre-harvest work center. And another sub panel with the uh, micro grow relay system and then the controller. Controlling 24 side awning windows, 52 roof vents, four uh, horizontal air fans and uh, two evaporative coolers and two exhaust fans. Now, I'm gonna back up actually, because I saw some eyebrows cross and some uh, eyes roll and it's like I thought we were on a budget here and doing things uh, a green-like. And where did the $3,200 stainless sinks come from and the $2,700 stainless steel work top and storage cabinet on both ends. I'll show you our shopping cart. We scored big this day. Every three months or whenever it works, we drop by a salvage yard up here that that's specializes in repossessions from restaurants that go under. They're so dirty and greasy and ugly, you don't want to touch them. We pull them up with the uh, front end loader. We blast them with a pressure washer and a degreaser. I get out my TIG welder and I fix the cracks and we straighten the legs and Gene puts a huge uh, sanding, buffing wheel on the electric drill and she goes to the whole things. They look like brand new. 10 cents on the dollar. That $3,700 sink costs us $250. So bottom line is on that summary, you got in front of you, we get green uh, building points for that. <laughs> the west side of the greenhouse is for the hydroponic gardens. And I ask you, what would you do with construction scaffolding after you've built three houses? Along the top of these scaffolds, this is a perfect work height, waist high. And around the top of them, we plan on doing a, a circular uh, set of four inch tubes. And that will be hopefully where the strawberries grow. And you won't have to pick them. You'll just have to reach up and bite them off. The north end of the greenhouse is our mechanicals sheltered by this uh, rooftop. And sir, to answer your question, we have a chemical free pool. No chlorine, no bromine, no salts, no ozonization, nothing that would tack our aluminum structure. And yeah, it's wonderful to swim in. It's potable, drinkable water. It's done by an ionization uh, chamber right here. I have a picture following this and I have a sample over there of it. Uh, the copper ionizes in there and there's an electronic oxidation process. This is uh, bought commercially online from ecosmartpool.com. If you go there, they'll, um, they have a great uh, explanation, of course, of how it works. I ask you this. How did the Romans 2,000 years ago sanitize and keep all of those Roman baths healthy? Healthy enough to, to swim and wash them. Copper rods, they stuck copper rods as often as they can. It didn't work as well as my little electronic thing, but uh, yes, it works very well. The copper ions inhibit the algae and the bacterial growth. You can drink that water. You can drink two gallons of water and that would equal the amount of copper in a multivitamin. 
The CO2 tank is for pH control. It gets injected by, and I didn't quite catch it, but that's the controller. And uh, it's uh, just the pH by um, providing and making carbonic acid. In the pool, I think it's um, 6.8. That's the Eco Smart Chamber. Uh, you see the copper electrodes there and the titanium electrodes. They're energized and the water flows through. Now, also on that wall, I told you for every three locations of the uh, rain harvesting tanks, we have a blue pressurized tank and the, the black jet pump. To the side of that, there are three valves and a fourth one just slightly off the screen that connect the well, the south tanks, the east tanks, and the west tanks. In the first couple of years, when one system got low, set, I had to use a transfer pump. And now I can open and close that manifold and totally feed the whole yard and distribute any of the water from any of the tanks. Uh, by the way, there's the, a full shot of that EcoSmart controller. Also is a, the pair of uh, evaporative coolers for the greenhouse. And this structure is a continuation of our Ramadas and it's been our project for the last uh, two months, December and January. Uh, next week, the metal sheet metal roofing comes. We can put that on. And then finally, Jean, put on our solar blankets to heat our pool. So this structure is to take advantage of thermal uh, and the energy to heat the pool. Now, I say heating. Most people don't think about this. In the winter, you run the water up through there during the day. It gets hot, heats your pool. If you put your blank, your thermal blankets high above the water at night, if there's an automatic drain back feature. So then the, the water doesn't freeze and you can actually use it every day all year round. More importantly, or equally, in the summer, you run it at night because then the pool water goes up into that cool evening air dissipates the heat and keeps your pool from getting over 90 degrees. We had our uh, hydroponic gardens. Now outside we have four sets of gardens. On the uh, west side we have our fruit trees and our tomatoes and our melons. This wall, Jean and I placed all those rocks. Those are the boulders that came out of the pool in the greenhouse. Some of those on this north end, starting here, they're a five and six feet. They're huge. A real disappointment when you just have a little, like, looks like six inches more rock you got to get out and you vibrate and you pound for like a good hour and you keep tracing it out and you get a five feet. It's, it's, it's enough to drive you crazy. Uh, there are trees there, but you can't see them because of the leaves. We have 14 fruit and nut trees, and the leaves are gone. What also grows well there are tomatoes and melons. And yes, that's a 10-foot ladder. That's how Jean picks her harvest. Oops. And this is our tomato uh, derrick, we call it. For $20, we make a derrick 10 feet tall out of half inch rebar. For $15, you can buy this little one right here, like with the rounded top from the local nursery. The second garden is the South Orchard. It's in the front of the house and uh, right there. And there are the kumquat trees. And you can see the uh, orange in them and Jean brought kumquats for everybody from that tree this morning. 
What also grows well here because that's south facing, planted. Uh, not only the citrus trees and fig trees, but um, peppers, cabbage, kale, and leafy greens. Our third garden are the East Terrace Gardens. Now why would I show you a garden in the winter? Actually, this was a terrific picture because uh, the white contrasts with the walls and you can see how we terraced the landscape four times to get different garden beds. Looking at it from the other direction, you can see how it wraps around the seven foot tank, basically eliminating it. It continues along to the back, wraps all the way around the uh, 12 foot tanks and creates this which we fill with our compost. We did the same on the West Garden. Our fourth organic garden is down in the zone, as I said, because it's cool. And um, the high chill hour requirement trees grow down there. Again, you can hardly see them. I'm sorry about that. But if you notice here, around every tree, it's a seven foot tall, um, remesh for concrete work, six by six grid. Keeps all the uh, animals from attacking it. And they're easily open and close to stand by themselves. Also down there, it's the composting. You can see all the different piles we get from the different neighbors and the horse stables and, uh, and the, uh, the, the rancher down the way. And we mix those all up with the um, backhoe. And then um, as they age, we move them up to the piles into the loading. Now we're going to switch gears to energy. This is the inside of our mechanicals room in the house. 12 circulating pumps go to every single room, the greenhouse, the pool, and circulate the water. Down here is in that room that looks like a dishwasher, about the size. That is a geothermal water to water heat pump. All of our heat and cold we abstract from the ground to heat our house. Out in the ground, there's 2,700 lineal feet of PEX tubing. And uh, when that comes back, the heat pump puts it into a thermal battery so in the winter, the thermal battery holds 100 degree water, in the summer, 50 degree water. Every room has a manifold and a thermostat. And outside of the mechanicals room was this thermal battery. It uh, has obvious disadvantages. It was located outside, so in the winter, when it's cold, you're trying to keep 100 degree water warm and the opposite in the summer. There are no provisions to keep it filled. I had to fill it at least once a week. It would evaporate. Every rodent for 10 miles in the winter would know that there was 100 degree water over there. And they would come and they would attack this thing. It was just disgusting. Uh, the bulging sides are because of a very poor manufacturing design. And the size of it only gave us two inches of uh, space, this pointer has a little delay on it. I'm not used to delays. Uh, there's uh, only two inches of space and there was never enough space on the top to always keep that covered with water. So we pulled that out. Uh, it's a nice system, we wanted to keep it. We built a room to that side out of ICF and we built a nine inch little swimming pool in there, nine inch thick walls, little swimming pool. And we lowered that heat exchanger into there. Now we have six inches of water all the way around. We have a, and then on top of that, we float a two inch um, styrofoam panel. We have a great thermal battery. Next to it, and here's where that uh, tank was. These are where all the mechanicals ran from the greenhouse into this room, electrical and plumbing. You see here, every water line was covered with this, a, a six inch diameter sleeve. 
with the pipe running through. Protects it from all that backfill, those sharp rocks, and of course insulated everything. I brought one of those over here too for you to see. Oh, I'm doing all right. I have three signal. I have three stop points. I, Rafi, Rafi is a wonderful man, but he's not a negotiator. <laughs> I told him. I said I would like three hours. He said one or none. And that was the end of the discussion. Now, up on the roof, we have a air-to-air -air heat pump, which, of course, you're probably you're all familiar with, I'm sure. It's connected to this LVHV HP system. Don't you love uh, HVA engineers? Do we got any in here? They like to use all these letters, and they all run together, and it depends what they mean. It's a, a um, low volume because the pipe coming out of here is uh, eight inch tube runs all the length of the house and off of there lives to be two inch tube. So it's a very low volume, it's not a big dust. Because it's low volume, it has to have high pressure and then high velocity to get through there. It's exactly what you see on the airplanes with that little thing coming out and it just whistles at you really loud. That's what we have in the house. All over are those two little those little two inch uh, ducts. Now I'm going to start up here in this corner. The problem with this system, the hydronic, when you try to cool your house, it does a great job down here and our air is fairly dry so we don't get wet slippery floors like you would up north. But you still have a little residual humidity in there. So what we do here, we program the attic unit to run for one hour in the morning at 60 degrees. So we like it about 73, 72. So after that, it knocks it down about a degree, but it takes all the humidity out. Good for the day. The system hardly runs. Now there's two speeds in this air system. The low speed runs 24 hours. You never hear it. You don't know what's going on. You don't, you don't hear it, you don't feel it. And this right here, I have to read it because I copied it out of my book, out of my manual. There's an electrostatically charged needle fiber filter and a photocatalytic UV converter that removes 93% of all airborne allergens as small as 0.3 microns. So we get quiet and we get pure air. It's uh, really wonderful. Uh, of course, this system wouldn't be complete without domestic thermal water heating. The house uh, in the U big U shape, um, we need a circulating pump. Keeps the water going around all the time. Creates more storage. It just kind of makes for a, a bigger water heater. And uh, you always have water, so hot water, so you're not running and wasting water. And it's very eco-correct. We have the solar field. And uh, after watching some SEAC videos, trying to learn how to speak, um, we did watch agrivoltaics uh, one evening. So um, when we're bored and have everything else all under control, that'll be our future home of agrivoltaics. It's nice because our system is good 12 feet up off the ground. The uh, solar inverter, uh, the biggest problem down here is the heat. They get very hot and then you get the weather on them, but it's tucked in there, inside under our breezeway. And now I'm going to welcome you to the inside of the house. We're going to talk about uh, those three items. Starting with the fact that when you walk up to the house, there are these beautiful verandas covered all the way around with ramadas. Now, our friend and his wife had their own surveying business. He had a passion for passive solar. So he not only positioned this house on the, that knoll at the right angles, 
but he designed the height and the angle and the length of every Ramada and they all change around the house. We didn't get any sun in the summer and in the winter, it just flows in the windows. It's really incredible. Uh, please take off your shoes when we enter into the house. And when you do, you'll notice that the threshold and the walls are 13 inches thick. Our walls are um, ICF, that's insulated concrete forms. I brought a sample here for you to touch and feel. Every foot, there's a five inch diameter hole and every foot horizontally, there's the same when you lock them together. And every one of those holes goes half inch rebar and then there's filled with concrete. Everywhere is that styrofoam is that it's a R47. Where the uh, concrete is, it drops a, to uh, are 27, but uh, it's pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Uh, it's manufactured by Mikey Black right here in Tucson. Uh, and the other uh, energy green, the green, building green part of it is uh, all the scraps and the fitting and the cut, they all go, we take them back to the manufacturer in Tucson when we come into town. He regrinds them and uh, then he sells them back to us <laughs> in another form. So I'm not sure that's so good or not. Our ceilings are all barrel vaulted between the Vegas. Now you can imagine framing with uh, two by fours, cutting out arch pieces of plywood, lathing and plastering, uh, a lot of uh, materials and a lot of expense. It's 15 inch thick styrofoam panels. I bought one of those right back there too. And uh, they insulate, um, give us uh, uh, great insulation value and sound quality. The ceiling beams, those are 16 by 16 inch timbers. They come from a 1920 railroad bridge in Pennsylvania. So we're recycling. We don't like to go to town but once a month. So you got to have some way to do that. So the, this uh, seven foot refrigerator freezer reduces our carbon footprint, huge, big time. On top of that, it's efficient because up on the roof, we have two remote condensers. So all the noise and all the heat's up on the roof. The condensate you get inside the refrigerator when it goes through the defrost cycles, that's direct plumbed into the gray water so we don't have any. So in the summer, you're not fighting the heat, not putting the heat and the moisture in the house when you're trying to get it out. Hello, button. Okay, we also um, we live in paradise, but we do have a few nightmares. <laughs> and my, well, the one is that that nice refrigerator will go kaput someday when we wake up. We have a six by eight foot walk-in chiller. And uh, we may be a little optimistic, but someday we hope to run it maybe at 50 degrees and store our harvest, vegetable harvest, fruit harvest. Uh, of course, induction cooktop is uh, the best, I think. The efficient. Uh, front load washer, we all know what that is. And you're all going to say, ah, yes, the dual flush toilet. No, it's a dual feed toilet. Behind the wall there, I have two ball valves. One is hooked to the domestic water system. The other is for the day that it gets low or we have a problem or a pump failure then the other is hooked to the rain water tanks. So uh, we are, we, when you live in the desert, you have to follow the supply and demand rules of the desert. Uh, windows, 
Of course, we wanted to do energy efficient windows. When we bought the house, the windows were made of uh, two by 12 rough um, uh, bucks. And then a piece of glass stuck in there and stopped, glued and nailed both sides. And the termites loved it. So, and they were all real tiny windows. We wanted big windows, view, we wanted to be open and enjoy the fresh weather as many months of the year as we can. Not an easy task when your walls are concrete and rebar. So we bought a water-cooled diamond-tipped chainsaw, cut out every window, and then we put in um, aluminum jams with a thermal brake barrier. And our jams are four and a half inches. The thermal brake barrier uh, means that you don't get heat transfer to and from. And it also prevents thermal expansion and warping of the windows because one side is one temperature, one is another. Um, this is Margot and Moxie. Uh, their nickname says Decon and Tomcat. We do not use any portions or chemicals or insecticides. Um, we don't want that getting into the food chain. How am I doing, Rafi? I have about two minutes and that's all it's gonna take me. I promise two more minutes, okay? I've, for two minutes, I can be uh, scholastic, right? I can uh, try to present this in a, or in a nice format, structured format. Everything I said falls into the five categories. First one, the residential structure. We have, I talked about green building materials, energy conservation and energy efficient appliances. Uh, as far as water conservation, we have well water, rain water, and gray water. Our energy sources are passive solar, thermal solar, PV solar, geothermal, and uh, heat pumps. Our food production comes from hydroponics, uh, organic orchards, and again, no chemicals or insecticides. Future projects, uh, I already mentioned uh, voltaics, agrivoltaics. As far as the uh, PV, uh, photovoltaic, we would like to get an electric vehicle to use that excess energy. And uh, we would like to get, when they get the cost of batteries down, we'd like to get a battery bank um, just for overnight use. Lastly, but not least of all, we would like to do a little bit more R&R, swim in our warm pool and just enjoy what we've made. I started with the morning sunrise. This is the morning, this is the evening sunset. We're looking at the Tumacacri Mountains. And I thank all of you very much for your interest. It's been an honor to be here. All I can say is, wow. I mean, this is totally an amazing achievement what we read in the books. There's yeah. Nothing original about our well, that we tried to put it together in a format that means we don't have an electric bill, we don't have a sewer bill, we don't have a water bill. Uh, they're fixing our costs and making sure it's a standard of living that we want. Totally amazing. Uh, it, 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 the uh, beginning of your talk, you mentioned uh, how the Romans uh, cleaned uh, their baths and it reminded me that 2,000 years from now, there's going to be an archeological expedition and what they will find is your piece of paradise still standing and still working. Okay, questions. Whoa, a lot of questions, yes. You might not fully realize it, but about five or so years ago, Walmart was looking at some of these technologies 
in regard to the uh, geothermal areas below the parking areas where the black collects heat, et cetera, and with Stirling pumps, they could work with the energy conversion. And I would encourage you to just contact them to present this to them in terms of a commercial applicability throughout the nation and through all their other areas, because they actually are interested in doing just these types of things to show that they can be ecologically good servants to the community. Uh, that's a very nice of you, but like I said, uh, we're not here. We know we can't teach any of you anything. This is what we've learned from you and what we've learned from the literature. So uh, Walmart should just read a little bit more. <laughs> I, I actually disagree with that because I was thinking that what you have done and how you have done it and how you access technology and ideas uh, would be a terrific way to interact with the College of Agriculture, the College of Architecture uh, here uh, as a teaching uh, thing for students. So I well, hope you keep uh, the door open for that. Hey, I'm, we're, both of us are very flattered and thank you very much for that and we would love to help here however we could. Um, and it's a far, far away from what we normally get when people see what we're doing they think we're a little loony. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, uh, I'll tell you this. We had an unlimited budget and we exceeded it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, uh, in all seriousness, I, I don't know what it was and it's a, a little abstract. Uh, I told you about the grading or the excavation, and I told you the costs on uh, uh, the rain tank harvesting uh, that they wanted 40 plus, and we wanted spent about 12. Uh, the swimming pool, uh, we had two bids on that, 50,000 and 60,000. They would not touch excavation; that was extra. The heating and did not include, it only included two return jets, not 12. Um, we had a friend come by in the trades. He said, this pool, the way you built it, would be over $100,000. Our materials were 20,000. So um, what it cost us and what it cost us, um, that's the attainable part. And uh, what other figures can I share with you? I don't know, but uh, the, you, part of the point of why I wanted to come here was sustainability, living sustainably is not just little things that everybody do, does that adds up for the future. I mean, that is, a, that is an important thing to do worldwide, but you can do it yourself and you can do it smart and you can be clever and you put out a little bit of energy uh, or work, and uh, you can uh, you can get it. You can reap the benefits today with the principles that everyone is predi uh, predicting or whatever for tomorrow. Well, it's a today thing, and you can do it. Uh, work. Our friends say all we do is work. Um, we define work as dreaming, creating, and enjoying. And every day we love what we do and we're able to stand back, see the progress. Uh, we wish it was a little faster, but we enjoy it. And I don't have a total figure. Um, I would also like to quote uh, George Burbank in his book on gardening in Southern Arizona, something like that. He says, don't keep any receipts and don't ever add it all up. It'll take the fun out of it. <laughs> any more questions? Yes. Uh, well, like in, uh, I think in the beginning I mentioned we we bought this property five years ago. And uh, the house was there. Um, 
but it's best for me to say it's just a shell. Um, and the, uh, they had the great ideas and, and they fit our outlook, but the geothermal system, it was there, the heat hydronics was in the floor, but for six years of living there, it never worked. And they used electric space heaters. Um, and uh, so I forget why I deviated, but how long did it take? We started with the shell five years ago. We had to totally remodel the house. The greenhouse we started to go on the 15th, and I smiled because we have to be totally done with the greenhouse and the Ramada and the uh, geothermal addition storage battery by February 15th, or we have to reapply and pay for another permit. He came on Monday, and I think he's so tired of coming out, and he could see, um, I say this somewhat humbly, there's nobody who can question what we did. He signed off on Monday. So um, we're pretty excited. The, so the greenhouse took two years to where we are today. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I was wondering what kind of waste you generate and what you do with that waste. Waste. Yes, the, um, we very sheepishly load that shopping cart up uh, with waste. Uh, it's it's bad right now because um, construction. Well, and because we gutted the house, um, so we have a construction waste, and we have to go to the dump uh, every. We go every couple months, and we throw that away. Otherwise, our waste, gene compost, all food. Um, we all we recycle all of our recyclables. We take them to the dump and where they have the recycle bins. Um, and our actual garbage, garbage, it's not too much. Does that answer your question? Anybody else? For waiting for the cost of batteries, solar batteries to come down, are you able to bank any solar electric? Or lights uh, and whatnot at night? Yes, and that was, um, I, I think we would have gone with batteries right up front, but the uh, because the house was existing, the electric from, from the power company was already dug up three quarters of a mile through rock up to the top of the house, so that was there. Today, that would cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $60,000, $80,000 just to get the line up there. So if you were trading off doing that for batteries, we would have definitely gone to batteries right up front. So now though, we are on net metering because we got in uh, four years ago, five years ago, and uh, we sell our energy or we, they bank our extra hours, we get it back. But in the five years we've been doing it, we always, um, and then they give you a check at a certain time of the year, which is October, and we've always gotten about $200 back. But of course, that $200, they're paying you, if we had to pay it, it's 13 cents an hour, or 13 cents a kilowatt. They're buying it back from us for what they generated for, which is three cents. So in your solar design, you don't wanna over design, but when we did it, uh, we were planning for the pool and the greenhouse. And uh, so now with this all done, we might be about equal or that's why we want to get an electric vehicle because right now the most efficient storage batteries on the market are in electric vehicles. So if you have extra power, put it in your car. Um, did that answer your question? One more question right here in the center. So uh, no, I was I was just wondering. So kind of relates to the battery question. If you were to do a battery system, uh, because you did mention that's one of your projects that you're planning to do in the future, 
Uh, would you make it yourself, like completely DIY, or were you thinking about contrasting that in from like, let's say like a Tesla power bank that they, I know that they're pretty reliable, but they don't really provide yeah. uh, store too much power. So in your case, especially because of a... Yeah, well, hopefully large... things will progress to where the DIY stuff is out there. Okay. I really wish we could have done our own solar field. There's so much legal tape in that process with the county and the state and the power I couldn't deal with it. So, okay. So uh, we, we, we went that, and I'm sorry. I am sorry. I wish I could have done it myself, but it, uh, we keep saying we can't do everything. We have to subcontract some of the stuff. Right. And for the photovoltaics, did you guys, you, did you say you contracted in, or did you guys install that yourself? No, the PV field, we yeah. uh, uh, hired a company. Uh, okay. Uh, and it'd be out of uh, Phoenix called uh, American Roofing and Solar because there was not one company in Tucson that would look at doing a field array. Okay. They all wanted to put it on the roof. And uh, number one is I work too hard already to keep my roof from leaking, let alone mm -hmm. pepper it full of holes, and then have that all that stuff away. And number three, we really the design of our house and the way it's built yeah. into that hillside. At, at dusk time, if you're standing up there and we're with some guests, we'll say, that's our house. And they'll go, where? I just see a hill. Because it's in the shade. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't want to ruin the architecture of a house. with. The May I ask what was the cost? To, I, I, I don't know oh, if you sure. mentioned that. The cost of the photovoltaics? Yeah, that's a pretty... Uh, common uh, almost like a, something you would order online and all three of our quotes were all fifty thousand dollars okay and was that with the contract and everything the fifty thousand dollars like that was a fifty thousand dollars again was no excavation we had to have a level area so you guys excavated yourself yep. again for that yep. and then uh, they brought in all the materials and put it together and turned it on with the electric Um, I have a quick question. Before doing this, had you done anything like this at all? Um, were you like renovating your last house in a similar way, or was this just we've done spontaneous? So, we've done several homes, um, but more specifically, uh, in her own business shortly after we got out of college, and I thought she was. And five years later, I've joined her, and we've been working together. We worked together for 25 years. As an architectural millwork business, we designed, built, and installed interiors for banks, hotels, restaurants, and mostly for very high-end homes. So we've been around construction and the trades, and we did all of our design on AutoCAD. And of course, with kitchens, I had to know plumbing, I had to know electrical, and I had to be out there in the field and argue with them. Say, no, we're going to do it my way. Um, so yeah, a lot of experience. And during that time frame, we bought and sold and remodeled houses. Two questions. Did you uh, find any grants for the sustainable aspects of your house? and? Do you use uh, CO2 for the greenhouse? Uh, grants? Yes. <laughs> no, but it would have been a novel idea. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I guess I didn't know, know anything would be available. We just did it on our own. Uh, the CO2 is used only for the pool to adjust pH. We do not add CO2 inside the environment, but um, we're... We're, our hydronics has only been up eight weeks, and so we're um, the like uh, Dr. Gene said. Uh, you guys are on your honeymoon, and he was right. The first six weeks were wonderful. <laughs> the last two weeks has um, been a challenge. One more last question. 
you told us about the gray water system, but what happens to the water from your toilets and why did you choose to have toilets with water as opposed to like composting toilets? Oh, I don't know. I just, I would have an aversion to uh, composting toilets. That's a personal thing. Uh, the toilets were already in the house, uh, number two. Uh, the three inch uh, sewer line goes down into uh, two 1,000 gallon holding tanks. So um, I don't think we'll have to empty those for as long as we live. And then they, that goes downhill in had to be clearing because they they had excavated to put in all the septic pipes and that clearing is is a little more we live in the highlands in the highlands the high desert so it's a grassland um, and we live on a ranch there's 250 head of cattle and because the rancher um, it's 22,000 acres, all fenced in and gated to keep the cattle in. And uh, in the center of the ranch is the ranch's property, 900 acres. The other 21,000 acres, there are 20 homes. So we all feel like we have 1,000 acres. The rancher retains the rights and has a lien on your property to graze his cattle. Because of that, uh, we got rid of three pieces of property in the city that were costing us dearly for property taxes and now we live in a place where um, it's ag status. So to answer your question, um, I like to think that the sewer water goes down and makes that grass really lush so that we get more cattle because we love the cattle, and then we like to make sure we take a picture of the cattle on our property to show the town inspector, yes, we do graze cattle on our property. <laughs> but. Fantastic story. I want to thank you and Jean uh, for coming and sharing your uh, piece of paradise with us. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you. <laughs>